Hi, everyone. Um, it gives us a great privilege to introduce our second speaker to San Francisco Haskell Meetup. Uh, our, our next speaker is uh, Dmitry Komanikov, uh, who's going to be doing a talk on beginner-friendly introduction to free monads. Over to you, Dmitry. Thank you. Thank you, Solar, for inviting me. And I'm really happy to be here. I hope you'll enjoy my talk. And yeah, uh, let's start. But before we start, I want to tell a few words about myself. Currently, I work as a senior software engineer at Field. I'm also a Haskell mentor. I have my free Haskell course for beginners, which is called Haskell Beginners 2022. I also have my own consultancy. So uh, you can go to my website and find me in social media to read more about myself. I've been using Haskell in production for multiple years, and I've been using free monads in both industry project and uh, hobby project. So I hope you find helpful what I'm going to share with you today. So uh, what this talk is going to be about. First of all, I'm going to start with a few motivational examples of uh, problems that's slightly awkward to solve in Haskell. Then I'm going to introduce this idea of data oriented programming, which is a nice concept. And then I'm going to use how this idea is connected to Freeman nuts. And my hopes is to give the gentlest possible introduction to Freeman nuts so you can actually understand what is this and when do you need to use this and when not. But this talk is not going to be about some math or category theory behind Freeman nuts. So there will be nothing of that, or there will be also no implementation detail of Freeman nuts. It's probably a topic for another talk. And I'm also not going to talk about a relation of free monads to effect system. I know they're quite used in this area. So my idea is not to convince you to like to use free monads all the time or to never use them. I don't generally like opinions like this, but just to give you an idea um, what is a free monad and how you can benefit if you decide to use it and know what will be the cost of this usage. And also content warning, this presentation will uh, contain different variety of Haskell codes. It will be boring, ugly, fancy, and some unsettling Haskell code, and a lot of graphical images. So uh, saying all that, let's start. And uh, let's start with some problems, some awkward code that, uh, or some unsettling problems. So we have a user data type, and the user, uh, has a password inside and we can accidentally print this password to the terminal or to logs. We can do this either by, by using show instance of a user or by just printing the password directly. And we don't necessarily want that. We want to avoid the ability to lock secret and private information in our logs. So how are we going to prevent this? There are multiple ways you can do this. And one way is to implement like your own printing function this one is a little simple and what it does. And if there is a password inside the, the string you're going to print, I mean, any mention of password or anything else, we just go and replace the entire string with a reducted uh, literal and print it. So it's like really robust security. Otherwise, we're just going to print the entire string. So, uh, I mean, this is a really silly solution, but all the solutions I've seen is some variations of uh, this one, whether you reduct the entire string or whether you reduct just a single JSON field, uh, it doesn't really matter, but there are like some problems is that now you need to go and chase and replace all your functions. You need to configure linting to not use the default print line and use this custom. And even if you do some stuff, some smart stuff with imports, you still need to change. So gender doesn't look nice. So yeah, would it be nice to have a better way to solve this problem? Okay, let's talk about another problem. So let's say we write a Haskell program and we want to call uh, some external processes, some external commands from our Haskell process, from our Haskell program. Let's say there is a library that provides this sh function that takes a string, a name of the command, and a list of arguments for this name of the command. And in our Haskell code, we just uh, write a function that calls all of the, these two git commands. And what these two git commands should do is that they uh, should basically erase your local changes. But what we want is that when you run some external commands, you want to be able to see what you're actually going to run before running, because you know this is a pretty dangerous command. And command line tools usually implement this dash dash try run option, where before running something, you can get explanation of what is going to be run and you can later commit to that. 
So how are we going to solve this problem with dry running? Again, a naive solution would be to implement your own custom MySH function, which takes a separate Boolean value, whether it's a dry run or not. And if it's dry run, instead of executing command, we just print in the command to the terminal. Otherwise, we run it as before. And here we start seeing some problems before because you had a function in some library, and now you want to add just one option to that function. But if you want to add more, it will be really difficult and it's like really becomes not really a pleasant interface to work with and there are several problems with this solution and this approach so first of all we haven't solved the problem of dry run entirely we only solved it for this particular sh functions but some haskell functions also may change your environment like write into files or anything else and yeah, there is no solution for doing this. I mean, this particular solution doesn't solve this problem. Also, uh, there is no really nice way to combine different patches to SH. So I say someone wrote this SH function in library. Now you want to add the ability to do dry run. And you, let's say you write in, in your own library and your function. And then someone else takes the original SH function and they implement a different patch. Let's say some optimization for calls or maybe running some different commands instead of the one you specified you can use your imagination but now you want to use both features you want to use dry run and someone else patch and how do you combine well there is no nice way you need to write another function which will take options for both of them and will run depending on which really not nice and other problems how do you actually test this problem because i mean i'm not going to start the entire discussion about mocks but it's something to think about and there is also not nice way with this approach so yeah Again, it would be nice to have a better solution to this problem. And let's talk at final third example. Uh, before I go to the code example, I'm going to introduce a problem. So when you write a command line tool on GitHub, you have the ability to host the binaries on GitHub as well in different assets, like in uh, ar ar archives. And uh, usually when you write a tool, you provide it for different platforms like macOS uh, for Windows and for Linux and the way how you tell for which platform your tool is compiled is by the name of this asset. So you can see the four different names of this asset, some checksum and some uh, name of the asset. So you can see, okay, this asset me mentions Apple Darwin. So it's probably for macOS. And we want to write a tool uh, that uh, matches on the name and uh, gives us like the operating system of this asset. So we can understand which one we need to download and install. So basically this idea, and usually these asset names are not really standardized. All people uh, write whatever they want in different formats. And uh, uh, yeah, we just want to be able to match fuzzily on all the stuff. And uh, again, naive solution would be is to write something I call the if maze, is that you have this huge uh, chunk of the if code and you check all different branches of the stuff. Like if the string contains this substring, then we do return this stuff. Otherwise, we, we go to another check. And it's really a difficult code to write and then understand you need to go this for this. And nobody wants to write to code like this. And most, most importantly, nobody wants to read code like this. And it becomes even worse because once you need to change your logic, you need to uh, go for all this entire problems and for all the code in, from this jungle of if branches. And also how do you ensure that you covered all the branches? It's really uh, not nice. Again, there are multiple ways to write this particular code better. I'm not saying this is the best code, uh, but generally uh, there could be some different uh, variations of this or hiding this problem. It's much more difficult to find the problem in a, some complex in a big system. So yeah, we have this nice statically type language called Haskell, but then we kind of like really realize, rely a lot of on bulls. And uh, we have lots of problems with these examples. And just to uh, give you an idea of the main like common thing about all these problems, the, all these problems come from the fact that um, you cannot really do lots of stuff with the function. You cannot really introspect, introspect it because a function is written somewhere in the code and you cannot do lots of stuff with this. If it's in the separate library, you can call it, it's like a black box. So you cannot uh, see what's inside. You can only press buttons. You can control what is happening via the arguments of this function, but you cannot do anything stuff. 
programmers want to have a clay that you can use to shape everything they want, but what they're given is just black box. And if you want to have a better box, you cannot change this black box. You can build another box on top of this with another buttons and all this stuff. So yeah, cannot really control the behavior of external functions besides the argument they provide. We cannot introspect what function does. And this approach of providing these decorators, it doesn't compose nicely. So you need to build decorators on top of decorators and you need to uh, combine those decorators manually. And we all know that Boolean flags is not the best way to write these decorators and to control options. I mean, it's uh, known that it's better to use uh, custom enumeration types instead of Boolean flags, but they sometimes might just hide the problem. The code will look uh, nicer and it will feel nicer, but so to the point that you don't want to improve it, but there are actually a bigger problem. So uh, there are this are just three different problems and some three naive solutions to them. Uh, they they those two pro those three problems can be solved in a very different way, in a very unique way. But wouldn't it be nice to have a single approach uh, to reason about all these problems and how to have a uniform solution because the world is complicated and we would like to simplify it. So having a single tool to think about this problem would be nice. And this tool is called be called uh, data oriented programming. This approach is actually uh, not the one who invented it. It's described in a, a corresponding book written by Johanathan Sharwit. Apologies if I pronounce the name incorrectly. And you could read in more detail about this book, but I'm not going to go into much details about this approach. There is a book about it, but I'm going to, uh, to quickly explain how it uh, relates to Haskell. And the main idea of this approach is that uh, if we use data types like more freely, we can benefit quite a lot because, for example, you cannot pattern match on a function but you can pattern match on a data type and you can do a lot of stuff. You can introspect your behavior if you describe your behavior as a data type. Instead of speaking lots of loud words, let's just give a specific example. So let's return to the one of the problems I mentioned before, the, the third one, the fuzzy matching problem when we want to guess an asset name. And here's how a solution to this problem could look like if we use this uh, data-oriented programming approach. First of all, we are going to introduce a data type that describes uh, a query on a string. So we want to be able to describe uh, whether our string should contain some strings or should not contain. So we have this has constructor, which says this, our string should contain the text that we specified. And we have uh, some simple Boolean algebra on top of this, like we should contain, it should not contain this query or should contain this and this, or only one of those. And we can implement a simple match function, which takes a query, a text, and returns the Boolean whether the text matches our query. Again, it's pretty simple Haskell, just pattern match, and you can write it relatively straightforward. Then uh, we can implement some cute uh, domain-specific, embedded domain-specific language. So we can define our queries in a fancy and nice way. So well, for example, one way is like this. This is we specify our query, and what it says is that how, if we want to match on macOS x86 underscore 64 asset names, we have a query of that uh, for a string that should contain uh, Apple Darwin string, and it should uh, has a string like dot dot gz or dot zip, but it should not contain dot uh, sh 256 uh, string, so it shouldn't be hash, and it also should contain the architecture, so it's not uh, ARM. It's good old uh, 64. So this is our query. And then we can write a much simpler classify function, which just like if we match our query, then is this one, otherwise something else. So it's a really simple approach. It's one way to solve this problem where we just uh, written a data type that describes how we're going to match another function and then we use it. And this approach has uh, multiple benefits. So first of all, we separate relevant logic from irrelevant. So what is relevant logic here? Relevant for, for example, for guessing an asset name, we want to guess asset names on macOS and uh, the relevant logic is which strings the asset name contains and which not. So we, doesn't care, we don't care uh, about like checking the substring or calling specific library function or what is this, this is not relevant. 
this is irrelevant logic which is written in a separate match function and we can uh, we can like decompose our problem and understand our code easier so if we go to the implementation details to the match function we can read it and we don't care about specific assets but if we go to the specific asset we can see what string it contains and what what asset it describes and we don't care how exactly it matches so it makes our code understanding easier also this approach opens new possibility because you have a data type that describes how to match your method names you can actually uh, provide your user an ability to specify this data type sure this ability doesn't come for free you still need to implement a parser but at least you have this ability if it was that that if then else maze there is no way for user to provide this code and control this behavior and uh, also what's importantly is that now you can have it opens the door to uh, different interpretations so we have the data type we can match on a query and run it but we can also kind of like explain what are we going to use for example if we try to match on all queries and we haven't found anything we can explain to the user what we try to do or even to ourselves we, when we want to debug and this is also really nice Again, if there is a function, there is no way to explain what happens. I mean, you can use a debugger, you can work for the function, or if you're providing an error message to the end user, you can, of course, uh, just paste the entire code to them, but it's not really nice. So again, we took this approach, the data-oriented programming approach, we applied it to the problem, and we gained lots of benefits from using this approach and to open new doors. So, how this approach is connected to FreemanAs, and I'm arguing that it's actually connected, we can get all the benefits. But uh, before we jump to FreemanAs, let's actually take a, a long and enjoyable walk to understand uh, what is the problem we're trying to solve and why we need FreemanAs. So, Again, instead of just speaking about theory and some theoretical problems, let's solve a practical problem because uh, we are engineers, we solve practical problems and any approach, it's not useful if it doesn't solve a real problem. So what's our challenge? We want to, again, return back to one of the previous problems. Now this will be example two, where we had the shell scripting uh, system and we want to implement a better way to call shell scripts within our programs but without the limitations of uh, of all the pro without the limitations of the previous approach that we've written all the codes that you will see further can be found on my github repository uh, talks uh, there will be lots of code in haskell it will be simple code there will be only one single slide with fancy haskell features otherwise it will be plain, plain boring haskell but still uh, um, it's okay if you don't understand uh, some code you can go later revisit i uh, spend some time it would be nice uh, but um, my idea is not to make you able to understand the entire code immediately but just to give you an idea what it feels like and uh, what you're going to what you're going to get so let's start again main idea of the data oriented programming is to define all your actions as a data type and define your control flow as data type and what's not so use data types as much as you can so and let's start we, we are going to design our simple shell subscripting system and uh, we have uh, some commands but let's start only with a single command this is the most simple one uh, echo and echo will just print all the stuff we have in the terminal so we have a we have a data type we define our commands as a data type we have a cmd data type for commands it has one constructor for echo and a list of arguments these are the strings we are going to print in the terminal so this is our simple data type uh, but we're actually interested in running multiple commands not a single one so we create a new type script which is a just list of commands Again, pretty straightforward. And this is our example script. Uh, the first command is echo some strings and the second command to, and also the second element of the list is echo some other strings. So, so far so good, this is our example. And then we actually want to be able to run commands. So we write the function run command that takes a command and it, uh, because our commands in a, running, the result of running our command requires some input and output. So in Haskell, we work in IO Monad for this, and we just pattern match on the command to see what we actually need to run. 
again, because we have only one command, it's pretty simple. We just, if it's echo args, we just uh, uh, combine all the arguments with spaces and we print to the terminal. Pretty straightforward. Uh, and this is how we run single command, but we need the ability to run all the commands. So we need the ability to run script and we just use in traverse to run commands for all the commands. So again, traverse is the answer. It's pretty straightforward. But what we also gain is the ability to not only run commands, but to also, and for example, explain them. So again, remember one of our problems is to implement dash dash dry run option. And we want to see uh, what we're going to run. So we implement a format command function, which is a pure function. So it doesn't require any IO, it just formats our commands and it does the same. We just combine everything with words and we prepend echo the command to explain what we're going to run. And again, we have a way to run single command. And now we have a way, if you want to uh, explain the entire script, we just uh, map this function to all our commands. And it's also not traverse, but map is good enough. It's, a, it's still it's a pure function. You can use it for test or for anything else. But it's still uh, for our testing purposes, it's nice to have a function that actually prints all those commands to the terminal. So we will have this helper function, which will print all the result. And we will use it later to introspect what we're going to run. And this works. If we run our script, uh, we will see that it will just print all the words to the terminal. If we dry run it, we will see that we will echo all these words. In this particular case, the difference between run and dry run is not really different out from the outside, but um, it's great. Uh, we can always extend our language later, which we are going to do, but at least you can see how the approach works. And we solve the problem with dry run, but we also solve another problem. Now, it's impossible to write um, uh, files in our script because we don't have this command. We don't have command for writing files. We only have commands for uh, what we in, so what are described in our data type. So as long as you use those commands, there is no ability to do anything uh, weird. So this is the first step. And let's uh, improve our language. So it's all fine, but it's only a single echo command. It's not really interesting. Let's introduce another command, which is called ls. It, and each of these commands should list all the files in the current directory. So pretty straightforward. And we uh, implement this command by pattern matching. Now, when we want to run commands, we just pattern match on two commands. And if it's ls, as there is slightly more code, but the code is simple. We get the current directory, we get all the files in the current directory, and then we print all the files on separate lines. So this is basically what it does. And uh, But formatting is simpler. So what we implemented is the behavior of a shell command ls with options dash 1a. We just print all the files on separate lines. And the nice part about all the stuff and using the Haskell and the GHC compiler, the compiler actually has our backs. So when you add a new command, it now tells you, you need to go to all these functions and you need to update and support all these commands. So adding a new command is really easy because you also can be sure that you handled all the commands and you implemented them. And yeah, let's change our script. And uh, now it prints some strings to the terminal, then it uh, lists all the, all the files in the current uh, directory. And then we um, print some other strings and it still works. Now the output will be different. If we just uh, run a script, we will see that we print some strings. Then we print all the files we have in our current directory. And then we uh, output another string here. Uh, we, we specified, but if we dry run it, we won't print any files. We will print what is going to happen. So uh, yeah, it's cool. We can see how we can easily extend our language. There's not a lot of code. You can just now go and add uh, much more constructors. But so far, uh, there is another cool benefit of using the data-oriented programming approach. So we have like interpreters that run our commands, but now we have the ability to write transformations of our script. Because we implemented our script as a list of data types, we can do lots of cool stuff. For example, we can do some optimizations, like in this code, where we see two uh, calls to echo. We, 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 can, we say, well, we don't need to uh, get, have two calls. We can just we can have one call. We can just combine the arguments. So in this particular example, the behavior will slightly change. 
and it might not be really interesting, but it's the ability, you have the ability to transform your scripts and uh, you can do anything stuff. You can optimize, you can do this password reducted thing. You can just use, you can do the same logic. If there is anything mentioned of password in the string, you can just reduct it. And the nice feature about this approach is that it actually composes because uh, this function transformation of a function is just a function from script to script. And if someone else implements another function, from script to script, you don't need to some magically combine them. You can just compose these two functions and you will have two transformations. Of course, you need to think about the order of composition because it might be different, but it's possible. And because Haskell is lazy, you actually won't run transformations multiple times. They will be optimized depending on the script. So this is really nice. And again, it still works. If we have a script with two equals, and if we dry run our original script, we will see that it will echo two different strings. But if we optimize it first, we will see that it out will output on the single string. So which is nice. But uh, our scripts are not powerful enough. So we have a list of commands. We run them. Great. But um, how could we use the output of these commands? So our commands, all our commands so far just print anything to the terminal, but we want to be able to use the output of these commands. We somehow, we want to be able to somehow catch what those commands return and pass it further. And the truth is, is that the list of commands, like our the literally Haskell list type is not really powerful uh, for catching this behavior because when we have a list of commands, in some sense, they're kind of independent. We run commands in sequence one by one, but nothing stops you from running like um, 10th command first and then going back to the first. So there is no way in this particular presentation to somehow capture uh, the output of command and pass it further. But uh, the list data type might not be powerful enough, but the list idea is, uh, gr is actually great and it's what we need. So instead of using list of commands, we can slightly transform our CMD data type so it will look like, like, uh, like a list. And to tell you what I mean, so this is a refactoring to our CMD data type. So now each command actually stores the next command it will run. Uh, so when we have echo command, we, we still have the list of text, all the arguments we're going to print, but then we also have the next command that is going to be uh, executed after the echo. The LS case is slightly more difficult. So uh, instead of having just a command next, we have a function from a list of text to the next command. And the reason for this is that the LS command in our language doesn't actually have any arguments. So we don't provide uh, direct files to our list command. The ls command should provide the files to us. So in order to get the next command, when we will execute this command, the ls will get these files and then it will pass to this function and this function will return the next command. And because our data type behaves like a list, we will have the finished constructor in the end because we want to actually be able to finish our script at some point. So this is kind of like we made our CMD data type look like list. Again, it's a simple husk. So this is just a simple uh, sum data, some data type, nothing special. Uh, it's a uh, simple syntactically. So there are no fancy Haskell features, but it might be difficult conceptually to understand this idea. So again, it's okay to spend more time on this. This is a required transformation for what we do. And uh, I hope the next slide um, clarifies some stuff. So this is how we construct our script now. Um, now we don't have the script uh, data type anymore. So previously the script was new type over the list of commands, but our command now is kind of like a list itself. So we don't need script anymore. So we just operate with the CMD. And now we have... Uh, uh, how we construct our script. The first command is echo, we do something, but then we need to pass the next command. So the next command will be ls, it's a, the second argument of echo, and ls takes functions. So this is how it uh, comes into play. This is a function, it's a lambda function from files. So ls will give us files and we can assume further that we have files. We have files in the current directory and we can do different stuff. We can echo all these files or 
we can filter them and echo only some files or we can depending on what files we have we can echo different strings so all other fun stuff then we echo something else and finally we finish because we need to provide next command and the final command is the finish this is how we specify our script but um, again we still need the ability to run the script so what we're going to do we're going to change our previous implementation but actually in a very simple way all the previous code stays the same. The only change is that now we recursively call our run command on the next uh, function because now CMD is a list. So if you want to run the entire CMD, we need to run, sorry, we need to run the entire list. And if we have the command immediately, we just run this command after we are done with the current command. And if we have a function, like in the LS case, we, we see that what we do, we get our current directory still, uh, we get all the files in the current directory, we convert them to the list of text because this is how we specified our data type. And then we pass to the get next function and then we recursively run command. And when we come, came to finish, we just do nothing. So yeah, and the dry run uh, function is slightly more difficult. Well, we, st we still create a print every command, but we need to call our dry run recursively on the next command. And you see that here we finally see our first problem with this approach. Well, you, maybe you noticed some problems before, but the first problem is that uh, now the ls command it stores a function from some files to the next command so we cannot just recursively call to the function we actually need to pass some uh, some list of files and here's the way that we came up with a fake uh, file again because it's a haskell code it's a pure function you can come up with something more you can actually track which exactly ls at what line what uh, number of command it was running so later when you explain it you can see okay this uh, files will be run by this ls and something like this but this is like first problem we need to come up with some arguments in pure code or provide them externally and this is the price of having more features so we require more from our data type we wanted to do more but we need to pay the something for this and this is a limitation and uh, yeah this is a one problem of this approach but still this is not enough so again, okay, we have this nice little cool script. It uh, now we're able to capture output of some commands. Again, we can add more commands and capture the results, but our scripts still cannot do much. They cannot actually uh, return anything. And uh, the question is, can our scripts return a number? Can the result of executing a script be something meaningful? Because now it's just uh, round brackets in IO, nothing special. We only change environment, but can we return something from a script as a result? So for example, uh, we want to be able to return the list of files, the number of files in the current directory, or just all the files from a script. And we can do this if we change our data type in the following way. Now we make our data type polymorphic and our recursive calls uh, polymorphic with this type variable A. And now we don't just finish our command, but we finish with some value of type A. So now our command returns something in the end. And uh, this is example of our script. Again, it's the previous one, we changed only slightly. Now it's a script that returns some integer number. And in the end, we return the length of the list we have before. Uh, so yeah, now our scripts have the ability to return some values and we made them more powerful. And now we need again to do all the gymnastics of going to our code and changing it. But actually it's pretty simple. All we need to change is only this pattern matching on finish constructor and the type signature. So everything else stays the same, which is pretty nice. We only change the finish case. In the run command, we return the value from the finish. In the dry run, we just show the values that we are returning. And this is really nice because we just made our code more useful, more powerful by adding uh, a polymorphic type variable. And we almost didn't have to change lots of code. It's almost nothing. It's like a very easy refactoring for something as powerful. This is also a nice feature of Haskell. And uh, you probably noticed that uh, I haven't mentioned free monads <laughs> so far, not a single time. We, all we did is that uh, we had 
this idea of a problem and we just implemented it as a data type and we did a pattern matching, we did implementation and we changed our data type, we asked more and more, but it's still plain Haskell, we had data types. And uh, yeah, if you don't need anything more from this approach, so I hope I tried to convince you that there are some benefits in this approach, you can actually stop here because it's again, it's a simple code, it's a simple Haskell, you don't need to uh, add something more if you don't need it. And there are benefits in having simple code because you can actually understand it and reason about it later. But if it's not enough for you, <laughs> I welcome you to join me to the final part and to actually see what the free monad brings to the table. If you think that the previous code is not enough, uh, yeah, let's uh, unleash the full power. But to understand what free monads bring us to the table, let's first understand why the previous code is not enough. You see, it's pretty powerful. We have a data type, we have all commands. The commands can return values. Our scripts can return values. It looks like everything we need. But what else uh, do we need? And there are um, a few things that we actually might what need and a few limitations of our previous solution. First of all, there is this minor boilerplate uh, of having this command and being able to uh, having to need to run all the functions recursively. It's like, it's not a major boilerplate, so I wouldn't call it a big problem, but it's still you can forget to run recursive functions and it's another stuff. So something to keep in mind. It's a, again, it's the same problem with separating relevant details from irrelevant. Relevant details, relevant code is how we run a single particular command. It's not relevant how we run next one. So this like recursive descending is not relevant. Also, we don't have a nice composition of scripts. So let's say we wrote a single script that uh, returns a number of files in a different directory, but then we kind of want to write a different script. We can't actually really easily compose these two scripts because scripts are just data type. We need to write another function that somehow takes two scripts and composes them. And because scripts can be parameterized by different times, we cannot have list of scripts. So run scripts uh, one after another and we become uh, that we need to write lots of helper function just to compose uh, separate scripts. So again, we took our first problem of SH function where we weren't able to compose them uh, horizontally. We, 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 need, we needed to add options on top of options, but now we just transformed into a different problem. So we solved one problem, but now uh, we need to combine our scripts somehow. And there is no like no easy way to squash different scripts into the single file. And also there is no applicative OMONAD instance for our CMD data type. It's polymorphic. In theory, it could have, but in practice, there is no real way to write a lawful instance. And by itself, it's not a problem. I mean, we are not people <laughs> who are writing instances just for the sake of instances. But if you have those instances, you have a few benefits. So first of all, if you have an applicative and MONAD system, uh, is this is you can uh, have an access to a broader ecosystem. There are lots of functions that work for uh, arbitrary polymorphic applicative or arbitrary monos, for example, lift A2 or replicate M function. So let's say if our script was a monad, we can easily run the script five times using the replicate M, but currently we don't have this ability. We need to write this function on our own. So if we have these instances, we have access to all other ecosystem. And also, which is on like minor benefit, it would be nice to use do notation. If we have applicative and monad, instead of specifying this ugly data type, it would be much easier and nicer to have this little EDSL to write our scripts. So yeah, this is a power that comes if we use free monads. And the idea of how do we actually get this? So our CMD type is not a monad and we cannot write an instance. So what do we do? So the idea is that, well, the CMD type is not a monad, but what if some other type parameterized by our CMD and still storing our CMD is a monad? So what if we have this data type and the free data type is exactly that some magic data type. So here is definition. It's a data type with two type variables. Uh, one of them is variable of kind from type to type. I'm using standalone kite signatures to describe the type of this data type. And this data type just have two constructors. It has pure, uh, which is just value of type A, and it has role, a slightly more difficult constructor, but role, again, it has only one field. 
And this field is a value of type A, F, uh, parameterized by the free monad itself. So it's kind of like self-recursive data type. It's like tying the nodes on the type level. Really magic and cool stuff. And the nice part about this free data type is that uh, this data type has functor, applicative, and monad instances, actually. And it has this instance if the data type F only has functor instance. So we don't require much from our F data type. If it only has just simple, easy functor instance, then the free monad parameterized by this type is really great. And again, I'm not going to give into the details of implementing these instances. It's a nice exercise actually to use a type whole driven development to write all those instances and to understand how they work. It's really nice. I'm just going to give this idea of this uh, data type. So uh, what, but we, the problem is that we cannot just change our pre, we cannot just use our previous CMD data type with free as it is, we need to change it. So this is what we finished. At we have we had this CMD data type, and it was parameterized by type variable A. Everything's great. So we need to change it in the following way if we want to use it with free. So instead of recursively storing the next command, we just store a value of some type variable next. So this next it will be the next command, and uh, we don't have CMD as next. We have just polymorphic type variable next, and we also derive the functor instance again. We don't need to write boilerplate. The Haskell already can derive functor for, for us. Technically speaking, we can also derive functor uh, for the previous CMD data type. There is nothing special about this, but it's a nice thing that we can do this as well. And now uh, the comeback of a script uh, type. <laughs> I know you missed it. Now the, our script, the actual script, not a single command, but uh, actual script is a free data type parameterized by the CMD type variable. So, um, how this magic works, uh, again, not, not how it works, but how someone could come up with a data type like free, it's a separate question. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to them. They come up with this. Some, there's some smart stuff on mutual recursion on the type level. It's really great. And it's uh, really nice how this data type came into existence. Um, separate question how you can come up with something like this but i hope the idea is that if you want to be able so this step you want to have monad on your data type so how do you transform your cmd data type to have a monad and the idea is that you cannot just make your data type a monad but you can have a separate data type wrapper which is free and which is parameterized by your data type and it is a monad and you help you have all the monadic powers so uh again how can we construct a script with this data type? So our script, again, rem I remember, it's a free monad. So we need to use the free monad constructors. When we finish our script, it's just pure constructor. So just like finish, and uh, but it's called pure. Otherwise, we just wrap our command in the role constructor. But remember, the second uh, value of echo is the next type variable. And because in the free monad, the next is the free monad itself, so we use the free monad constructor role again to specify the next command. So this is uh, what we do if you want to define a script using the free monad definition like manually. So every we wrap every command in a role and we finish with a pure. That's simple, but um, this is not what we want because we actually just made, if we just use this interface, we, we only made our approach worse. Previously it was just command, but now our only command, but now it's somebody replayed in, in place of role and role and pure. Uh, the cool stuff about the free monad is that you can do better. There is this helpful function, lift f, which takes a functor and lifts and converts it to a free monad or lifts it to a free monad, hence the name lift f. And it's really easy to convert to free monad. So we have a functor fa, we f map the constructor pure, so we have f parameterized by free monad and we just wrap it in a role constructor. So we can convert any functor to, uh, to a free monad. And in our language, we can um, write two separate commands, echo and ls, that will do all this wrapping in role for us. So echo is just using lift f on the echo and the uh, round brackets and arcs and the uh, ls is just lift f with the id function. So again, this 
uh, it may take some time to understand in the first time how you write this uh, code, but actually this is boilerplate because there is a straightforward pattern. If your function doesn't return anything, you just use round brackets and in place of polymorphic variable, you just place round brackets. If you uh, need to return something, you use the ID function to convert the list and uh, it will magically work. And now, um, just to compare what we achieved previously, this is how we specified our script. But now with the help of these uh, functions, we can actually use do notation to write our script because our script is a uh, LS to free, remember? And free is a monad, which means that we can actually write our script as a monad in a nice in sequential style, uh, clear, no noise of other stuff. And again, because this is a, a monad, we can have access to all the monadic interface. We can now we can run script five times. We can get five integers from this. We can easily com combine them. So if we now have another script that takes integer, we can bind the result of example script. We can use example script inside somewhere. So we can basically uh, easily compose. We don't need to write all lots of extra functions to combine our scripts. We can just call them as separate functions. And yeah, it's a way to celebrate because we still have the ability to specify our commands as a list of data types. So we use this data-oriented programming approach to specify our commands as a list of type, but we also have the ability to write this do notation nice stuff. But again, uh, defining scripts is not our final goal. Our final goal is to run the scripts. So this is the most difficult slide on my presentation because it uses some fancy features like rank and types. And this slide implements uh, this function fault free. Uh, which actually just runs the free monad. So free is our script or whatever. It's a polymorphic function that works with any free monad. And what we need to give, what is this magic for all function? It's a function to run a single command. So if we specify how to run a single command, we can actually um, uh, run a list of commands or like a free monad, because in some sense, free monad is a list of commands. If you go to the example of our script, when we use roll, roll and finished with pure, you can see it's still kind of similar to lists. And again, this is a pretty simple function. We just do all the recursive calls. And now this is what I tell we separate relevant logic from irrelevant. All this running of all commands is irrelevant. We just do a recursive call. And now we can focus only on running a single command. So if we now go to our previous implementation of run command and we want to use it with free monad, there are almost no changes if you want to adapt to free monadic style. The only change is that instead of recursively calling our run command function, we just return the value next uh, in the pure. And the compiler, again, if you don't return pure, the compiler will uh, warn you, like expecting value of type are your next, uh, but pro provided some different value. So yeah, this is nice. Uh, and if you want to run an entire script, this is like the ultimate, the final, <laughs> the final form. We just fault free with a single command, with a single function run command, and we can easily run our entire script. So we have all the benefits of the data oriented programming approach, and we also have the ability to run. Isn't this wonderful? But again, remember our first problem was to be able to dry run a single command. Now. Uh, the long story is that a weird thing I noticed when I was looking uh, over the internet is that uh, everyone talks how it's nice to be able to introspect free monads, but nobody actually does this in their tutorials. And nobody uses this fault free function for something like dry run. And there is a reason for this. Now it is possible to do dry run. It's very easy, but it's some technical code details. I invite you to copy this SSH key into your browser and look into code. Uh, but yeah, you cannot easily use uh, fault free monad. But again, our free monad is a polymorphic type, it's introspectable, and you can do all the stuff. So um, yeah, just technical details, but it's still possible. But uh, the implementation details are out of the scope for this talk. And nice thing about uh, all the stuff is that you can uh, about Free monads and data oriented programming is that it can be applied to many more areas. So the idea of this talk um, started when I had an idea for a blog post, which is called literally 100 use cases for free monads. And I wanted to describe literally just 100 use cases for, for free monads. And well, 
working on the use cases, I realized it's not just about three monads, it's about representing our actions as a data type. And if you use this data-oriented programming approach, like the possibilities are unlimited, they're only limited by your imagination. You have the abilities to explain your commands to your actions or to dry run them. You have this ability to optimize different ways. For example, in our case, it was optimizations of two eco calls, but we can optimize multiple requests to the database into a single transaction, or we can com combine multiple network requests to a single call. And this is what the uh, Haskell framework Huxel from Facebook does. There is a nice technique called white box testing, where execution of your program actually uh, writes all the commands it does, and then you can replay all the commands. You, you can actually record everything what you does. This is possible with uh, free monads or data range programming approach. You can actually implement a mini just-in-time compiler. So if you run your multiple scripts or whatever, you can notice that some commands you're running faster. You can add some caching abilities because you can introspect the data types. You can actually see what it's running. And um, uh, then again, you can even do some cool stuff uh, like producing mermaid diagrams, sequence diagrams from your code automatically. If you describe your code, you can just get the diagram for free. I mean, that's, yes, that's the name, free monad. <laughs> you get lots of stuff for free. So yeah, uh, the possibilities are limited only with your imagination. And to just, the, the main takeaway from this talk is that if you define your actions and control, control flow as a data type, this gives you much more flexibility of what you can do with your code. And if you add free monads on top of this data-oriented programming approach, you even get the monadic power and everything with which comes with this. But with great power comes great responsibility. We've noticed several problems is that uh, when we return values, we need to come up with arguments. The free monadic interface might be difficult to understand because, again, it was all simple uh, Haskell before, except of one slide. There were no extensions. It's only difficult conceptually, but not syntactically and feature-wise. And also the, another cost is that the performance uh, of, because you run your free monad, you, you have a function to actually run your action. This can introduce some performance code and may reduce some optimization, some compiler optimization. So in practice, this uh, usually not a big problem unless you do some, uh, unless you really rely on this. So if your application is mostly IO bound and uh, limited by request to database, to login or whatever, it's not really a problem. But I mean, you add some power, so you need to pay with something for this. And if you want to learn more about free monads, here are some links. Uh, you can go to a free package on Hackage, which contains some implementation of free monads. The implementation there is slightly more differ different, and it has even more optimized implementation of free monads. There is another good introduction to free monads by Gabriela Gonzalez, why free monads matter. It's old, but it's still relevant. If you think that you want to understand free monads better and you want to look at more examples, you can read the introduction to free monads by Sirocco. And um, there is another example. Uh, in my talk, I mentioned example only one language script language, but if in your program you have multiple different languages and you want to combine them, there is a nice approach by Alexander Granin called hierarchical free monads, how you can combine different languages free monads in a single one. And to just the balance uh, weights a little bit to provide you some critique. There is a blog post by Mark Karpov called Free Monads Considered Harmful. It contains uh, some critique of free monads and how you might not need to use them. Um, still, um, it's nice to read and see the trade-offs. I don't think the blog post does free monads uh, justice, but um, it could be nice to, um, to, to have a different view. And uh, that's all. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, I will share my slides on my website, so check it out uh, later. And uh, yeah, I hope at least you have a better understanding of Freeman Nuts now. Thank you. Dimitri, thank you so much for an awesome talk. This was fantastic. Questions, everyone? Just give it a few. There's a lot of people thanking you for the great talk. Yeah, you're welcome. Any questions, anyone? Anyone on the Zoom? While we wait for the Twitch yeah. delays to happen. I was a little bit afraid this talk maybe could be too fast.
but as I mentioned at the beginning, you can check the codes, the, the code later and understand. I mean, uh, learning new concepts and new ideas usually is not for free, despite the name. <laughs> it takes some time. Great. So I've got one question. Any references for the derivation of free monads using mutual recursion? Uh, so the blog post by Gabriela Gonzalez, I mentioned, it gives uh, you an idea. It starts from a slightly different angle and it uses like this mutual recursion and how you can use and it provides more explanation. So if you start with this uh, data type CMD polymorphic by next, you will get some problems if you try to use it as a list of commands and how you can use it uh, to do later. So yeah, I, I would be my next recommendation if you want to dig into this. Great, great. Well, thanks for that. Any other questions, anyone? But other than that, um, uh, Seller, it looks okay. like there's a question in the, in the chat there. Yeah, yep, I just saw it. Uh, this this looks like it could be used to parse DSLs. Are there libraries which automate that? I'm not a. I'm afraid I'm not aware of any libraries that do this. But it's a great idea. Why don't you write one? Sounds like a nice project. Yes, that's, 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 it'd be perfect if someone could write one and then come and do a talk on it yeah. on this exact forum yeah. as a it'd sequel. Be cool. yes. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> great. Uh, great. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I don't see any more on Twitch. Let me just refresh my meetup page in case anyone put comments on the meetup page, just to be sure. Yeah, no comments related to the talk on the meetup page either, nor on Matrix. Matrix, great. On that note, we did, this group does have a Matrix channel in case anyone wants to ever have a conversation about anything related to the meetup or any of the talks we've had. Great then, well, in that, in that case, um, as I know our speakers are evening time for them, let me not keep them uh, waiting to enjoy their evening any longer as a Saturday night. And um, thank you everyone for attending. Really appreciate it. I hope to see you all at the next event. And if I don't speak to all of you before Christmas, have a good Christmas and Chris Christmas. I know it's a bit early to say that, but the, the, all the stores here are already selling Christmas stuff. So I think it's appropriate to say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, um, have a great weekend. And once again, thank you to both of our speakers for an awesome talk and putting in the effort to do it. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend all. Thanks. Thanks. Have a great time. Thank you too. Thanks, Thanks. Yeah. Thanks Bye. Kevin, for having me. Pleasure. Bye. Bye, everyone.